morning and welcome back to another episode of the Red Chip Burger Podcast. Coach Weasel is going to be leading today's conversation, but I want to pop in real quick, say hello and good morning, and also make sure to let you know that the Black Friday discount has a couple more days left on it. So if you're listening to this episode as it first comes out, definitely make sure to check that out now. I won't take up a bunch of your time letting you know exactly what's for sale. Just going to tell you, go check out redchippoker.com slash black, B-L-A-C-K, redchippoker.com slash black to check it out for yourself and pick out exactly the poker training material that's right for you right this moment. Again, go visit redchippoker.com slash black right now so you don't forget and lock in great discounts that you're going to love. All right, that's going to be enough from me for today. Let's get into today's episode. Here's Coach Weasel. What is up, guys? Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. We're going to be talking about productivity hacks. Now, this is something that you can Google search and you usually get a fairly long list. For example, top 30 productivity tips. And that just says to me that the person who wrote the list wasn't being very efficient. They weren't being productive with the way that they used their time. And that's typically one of the key ideas behind being more productive. It's not about using more time to do certain activities. It's about using that time in the most efficient way. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Why do we care about productivity as poker players? You probably know this, but it's easier than ever to waste time. Legitimate research has been done into the science behind taking people's attention. In fact, in some ways, attention is one of the most valuable currencies in the universe. That's why advert creators are happy to pay a fee every time someone watches their advert. And more than likely, you are constantly on the receiving end of this. If you've ever been in a situation where you simply can't stop scrolling through those TikTok videos, YouTube shorts, binge watching that entire new Netflix series, or perhaps watching a video you never intended to watch, but the thumbnail somehow dragged you into watching that video. The end result is that it's easier than ever to waste time because you are essentially the victim of a scientific process which has been designed and engineered to take your attention away from whatever it is you plan to do. Carving out distraction-free time is therefore going to be an important component in productivity, but it's not the only component. Often people think that productivity is about working harder. For example, perhaps you work in the office nine till five. Well, perhaps you could just boost your productivity by working seven in the morning till seven at night instead. But that's not necessarily boosting our productivity. Ironically, that could even be decreasing our productivity because the time we spend is actually less efficient. And that's really the core of productivity. It's not about working harder necessarily, but instead using the time we do have more efficiently. A simple example of this is the trial of four-day weeks in the modern workplace. Some companies have been rolling this out where they give their employee one day off a week. And what they found is the four-day week is essentially as efficient as the five-day week. What that means is employees were essentially wasting much more time in the five-day week compared to the four-day week. And the end result is they were just as productive over four days as they would typically have been over five days. Well, that's a boost in productivity. If you're only using 80% of the time, but getting the same workload done, you've used less time, but you've boosted your productivity. Now, the reason why it's important for poker players is it's going to have a huge impact on whether you are successful or not. You might be a very naturally talented player. You might generally win. But if you don't use your time productively, that's not going to translate into the type of success that you want. Now, let's just focus on that last phrase for a moment, the type of success that you want. What is that success? Many players don't do this, by the way. They just have a vague idea of potentially making lots of money, but they don't have specific goals. So as part of this podcast episode, take a moment to think about the following. What do you actually want to achieve? It's not necessarily the same for all players. One of the tools you can use for this is to project yourself into the future. Imagine in this future life, you're now living your perfect version of things. What does your perfect week look like? What do you actually do with that week? How much time do you spend working during that week? 
perhaps your perfect week is one where you don't do any work and you're completely free because you have a certain amount of savings in your account. That's completely fine. Perhaps it's something completely different. Perhaps you enjoy work or perhaps you are simply looking to generate a side income with poker, but continue with your current job if you already have employment outside of poker. It doesn't matter too much. The key idea here is that each one of us is going to have a different idea of what that perfect week looks like in the future. Take some time to map that out and use that to generate a list of goals. For example, if your goal is to become a professional player, figure out how many hours per week you want to play, how much money you'd need to make, and what type of limits that might be reasonable at. Now there's likely going to be a gap between that perfect week and where you are at now. If there's no gap and you're already living that perfect week, then congratulations, you've already met your goals. Maybe it's time to think about setting some new goals for the future. So now that we have a clearly defined set of goals for the future, we want to think about what our perfect week should look like now. And inside that week are activities which are all designed to propagate towards that future perfect week in an efficient way as possible. Now, this is where the next consideration comes in. Think about this question. How do the activities in your current week directly tie in to your end goal, that future perfect week? And what a lot of players find is that they are doing things during that week, which they think must tie in to their future goals somehow, but actually upon further analysis, there's not really a solid link between that activity and the future goal. In other words, although that player is expending energy completing a certain activity, and they might feel productive when they do that activity, it's actually very inefficient because it doesn't tie in with the future goals. Now that we know what our goals look like, every activity in the week should tie into those goals. Now we've simplified the process a little bit because we're just focusing on poker. But as you do this exercise, you want to think about all of your goals, not just poker related. And the activities in that week should tie into all of those future goals, whether they're related to poker or not. And of course, it's probably quite helpful if your goals don't all just revolve around poker. You want to think about other areas of your life as well. We can maybe think of some examples. Imagine your end goal is to generate passive income. You want to run a business where you don't really have to do a lot of work. Perhaps through automated sales, money just hits your account every month. But then you look at your current week and you're using that week to just grind poker 40 hours a week. Now, you're going to be a good poker player as a result, but there's obviously some kind of mismatch there. What you're doing with your current week doesn't actually tie in with what your end goal should be. So that's an example of a complete mismatch. Sometimes we find that our activities do match up with the goal, but they don't do so in a very efficient way. For example, your intention is to be a professional cash game player, but you spend a huge amount of your time reading books on MTTs, for example. Or the way you go about your cash game study time is just not productive. And of course, there is a certain element of skill in this to improve the efficiency of our study time in poker. But let's just say a lot of players completely waste their study time because they are doing things that are not incentivized. They're not directly going to increase their win rate at the table. So they put in a lot of effort, they expend a lot of energy, but they're not being productive because they're not efficient with the types of activities they employ in their study time. So once we have a list of all of the ideal activities that would take place in a perfect week, we need a way of organizing that information. So we're going to talk about calendar and scheduling right now. And from personal experience, I generally find that you need three different stores of a calendar or a schedule. The first is a general allotment of time for each week. So this is basically the perfect week mapped out. And I generally use a spreadsheet for this, but you could potentially use anything. You might use an online calendar for the general allotment of time for each week. That would be fine as well. I use a spreadsheet for this. This is a map of the perfect week. And once that map has been created, the first thing that we want to do is make sure every activity in that map ties in directly with one of our end goals. The second thing we need to do is make sure all of our end goals are actually covered 
in that perfect week. Because if one of our goals is being unmet, then we need to work that in to our weekly map. Once you've done that, you will need to test the schedule and see if it's reasonable. Downtime is important. Like that example of the guys working the four day work week being just as productive as the guys working the five day work week. Well, burnout is a very real thing. It can be tempting to schedule work from 6 a.m. till midnight every day. And that might seem like you're being productive, but you're actually being counterproductive because you'll be tired enough that all of those work hours, you're perhaps going to be operating at 40 or 50% efficiency. So you're burning yourself out, but you're not being productive. The second thing you'll probably need is a calendar for events. Now I use an online calendar for this. So this is specific events. So it could be special events. It could be appointments. For example, I would use this to schedule one-on-one -on -one coaching, for example, or any other events. And these events generally override your activities set for the perfect week. So maybe on a certain evening, you've got grinding planned, but someone has a party that you have to go to. Well, you put that on this specific calendar. It's now going to override any activity that you have on that perfect week map. That's fine. So long as it's not something that happens all the time and you start missing out on some of the activities in your perfect week. We have this general map as a baseline of default activities at every time of the week, but we then have a calendar where we schedule important events and these events override the events that are part of that general map. Finally, I found you'll need a to-do list and the to-do list, or you could call it a reminders list is going to list all of the things that you need to do for a specific week. Now we can't include those on the general allotment for each week, the general map, because we don't necessarily know what the specific activities we'll need to complete are in 10 weeks time, for example. So it's a good idea that every week you have a reminders or a to-do list and try and complete that list. On your general weekly map, you might even schedule some time for completing any miscellaneous items on your reminders and to-do list. Otherwise, if it's an activity that you don't complete every week, it's going to be very easy to forget to perform one-off activities that make their way onto the to-do list, but are nonetheless very important. So what ends up happening is these miscellaneous activities build up and you probably won't feel good if you don't stay on top of these. When you're trying to focus on your general weekly map, you'll just feel stressed because you know you have to perform those activities but you also have this backlog of other actions that you were supposed to have taken previously, but you haven't. And you're going to have to get around to them somehow, but you haven't really coded that into your weekly schedule. That's not a great situation to be in because it's going to decrease your productivity. When you're trying to focus on one activity, your brain's going to be thinking about those other activities that you didn't stay on top of. Okay, so I'd recommend that you have each of those three items. So the general allotment of time, the calendar for specific events and the reminders and to-do list. I still know people who go through their whole life without making use of a single calendar. And, you know, as a result, they're going to be constantly missing events. They're going to be missing important weekly activities, which if they don't perform those activities, it's going to be harder for them to reach their long-term goals. And they're also going to have a buildup of different activities that they don't complete because and it's not their fault. They just keep forgetting that they have to do these activities. But if they're there on a reminders or to-do list, then we can get those activities done. Okay, let's now talk about sleep. And sleep could potentially be one of the largest contributing factors to your level of productivity. It's extremely important. So just think about the answer to these questions. How much sleep do you need? So for most adults, that's going to be somewhere between six and 10 hours. It's not the same for everyone. So if someone's been trying to tell you that adults should only need seven hours of sleep, but you always feel washed out after seven hours, that might be because you actually need more than seven hours sleep. There's a little bit of a bell curve here where it's not a case of the more sleep, the better. Let's say, for example, your optimum amount of sleep is something like eight and a half hours. If you get 10 and a half hours sleep, that's not necessarily going to improve your performance. In fact, it will probably make your performance worse. So there is some planning and some discipline involved here. So as part of that plan, we need to know what time will we wake up? Hopefully that's already coded into your general weekly map. 
if you have actions planned from 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. in the morning, well, you obviously need to be awake at that time. If you're not awake at that time, then you're going to start missing out on some of those essential activities that you plan for the week. In order to be awake on time, we generally have to sleep at a specific time and we can compute that ideal sleeping time based on how much sleep we think we need. Now, it's all very well to have a specific sleep time and a specific wake time, but if it's not something you've been employing currently, there's going to be a period of adjustment. For example, if you typically sleep at two in the morning and decide now that you're going to adjust that and try and get to sleep at 10 every night and wake up at six, there's a fairly good chance you're not going to be able to immediately execute that. When you go to sleep at 10, your circadian rhythm is going to be telling you that actually you're not supposed to be sleeping for another four hours. You might struggle to sleep initially. So there will be a period of adjustment. Same for waking up. If you normally wake up at 11 in the morning and you decide you're going to wake up at seven, well, your body is going to be telling you that you've woken up in the middle of the night when you wake up at seven. There's going to be some serious discipline required in order to fix your sleep schedule at first. Now, it will get easier in time, but there are some other activities that might be worth considering that will help us to increase the quality of our sleep. So it's a good idea to experiment with certain things. For example, one of the things that experts recommend, and I think this does probably vary from person to person, but it's to avoid screen time right before you go to sleep. So in the half an hour before you sleep, you avoid staring at a screen or a device, maybe do something else like read a book. For example, if you mostly read at night right before you sleep, your body will begin to associate reading with sleeping. It will probably make you sleepy. It's going to be easier to get to sleep at the scheduled time. Another thing that can increase the quality of our sleep is our diet and also our fitness levels. So if we've done absolutely nothing during the day, if we've just sat at the office desk all day, it's probably going to be a bit harder to sleep. If we've engaged in some kind of exercise during the day, so we're naturally tired, it's going to be a lot easier to get high quality sleep, which is then going to boost our productivity for the following day. So think about the answer to this question. What are your plans to maximize your health slash cognitive functioning? So we're talking about sleep here, but we're also just talking about fitness in general. Now, I know that it's not possible for all of us to have perfect health, but you'll find that within your specific situation, there is a way of maximizing the health levels that you have for your situation. So it's going to involve some level of exercise. It's going to involve a healthy sleep routine. It's also going to involve thinking about our diet. One of the key ideas or the key goals when thinking about our diet is to promote stable energy levels throughout the day. So we'd ideally like to wake up in the morning, be productive and have that same level of productivity and efficiency throughout the entire day. But what happens to many people is rather than constant productivity, they have a series of peaks and troughs. So there are parts of the day where their energy levels are through the roof and they're almost hyperactive and almost need to slow their brain down. And there are other parts of the day where that person is just crashing. They can't really focus on anything. In fact, they just want to sleep. Very often this is linked to diet and consumption of other products like caffeine. So if you think about the way we distribute our meals throughout the day, the ideal incarnation of this is likely lots of small meals throughout the day that promote a stable level of energy. It's also a great idea if we can combine this with an understanding of how natural human rhythms work. And one thing you will have undoubtedly experienced is it's natural to have a slump in early afternoon. It's normal to feel tired at that part of the day. And you'll find as the evening goes on, you'll probably feel more and more alert, at least until it gets around that time where we're thinking about sleeping. So let's think about a really bad example of how to not function at the best possible level throughout the day. And that is everything collides to create a perfect storm. So around about lunchtime, we eat a very large lunch. And after that very large lunch, we consume caffeine. Initially, we'll have a burst of energy from the food and from the caffeine, but eventually we're going to crash from that very large meal. And that's also going to coincide with the part of the day where we're going to be in a natural slump 
And on top of that, we're coming down off the caffeine as well. So we can see three different elements have coincided to create a perfect storm. And if you've been in that situation, you might just find yourself washed out for the next two or three hours. There is no point having some kind of general map for the week when you feel that exhausted. In fact, once you're in that situation, best possible thing is probably just to go and sleep and try and recover and be productive for the later parts of the day. But we can completely avoid that. We know that humans have a natural slump in early afternoon. So if we do have lunch, we want to make sure it's a very light lunch. And if we do make use of caffeine, well, doesn't it make sense to make use of caffeine in the parts of the day where we're naturally low? So for example, rather than consuming a large amount of caffeinated beverages in the morning, when you're probably naturally fairly awake, at least after the first half an hour or so, rather than consume caffeine then, wait until that natural slump in the day and then use caffeine as a tool to propel you through that part of the day. By the time your caffeine is wearing off, your drive for wakefulness will have kicked in because we're now approaching the evening time, we are naturally going to get a boost of energy anyway. Can you see how we've thought logically about that? And because we are employing a specific system, it potentially allows us to have a very stable level of energy throughout the entire day and maximize our productivity and efficiency throughout the entire day. Okay, so let's very quickly revisit the topic of efficiency. We've touched on this briefly. The idea here is that each activity in our schedule should tie in with our overall goals. Sometimes your goals may change. So if your goals do change, make sure to review each of your activities and see if they still tie in and directly help you work towards your overall goal. There are other things that impact on efficiency as well. So think about the following question. How well does your equipment slash setup slash methods facilitate efficiency? So we also spoke about inefficient methods earlier in this podcast episode, the way that many players study the game doesn't help them become a stronger player as fast as possible. But it's also good to think about our equipment and our setup. You know, for example, imagine you are trying to play poker and you're still using a rollerball mouse from 20 years ago. That's probably not going to allow you to play the most possible tables. Think about your setup as well. Is it ergonomic? Do you have a good chair, for example? Imagine you are slowly destroying your back with a very uncomfortable, non-ergonomic chair. Well, that's going to eat into your productivity long term because now you might have to take out time from your general weekly schedule to go and visit an expert who can now help you with your long term back problems. If you just addressed that initially, then that would have helped you with your long term productivity. Thinking about equipment as well, think about things like your Internet connection. If you are an online player, how often are you being disconnected? Is it worth having a backup connection? These are just examples. You want to think about all of your equipment and your setup and all of your methods and make sure that they are as efficient as possible. Remember, productivity is not necessarily about doing more. It's about being more efficient with the activities that you do. Now, sometimes being more productive might actually involve doing less. If you're currently burning yourself out, then it could be that you actually need some more downtime in your schedule so that when you are working, or engaging in activities that propel you towards your goal, you're being much more efficient because you're more alert, you're enjoying the activity, you don't feel burned out. So downtime is an important part of a schedule. Make sure you don't just jam pack your default week with constant activities from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. That's not a good way to live and it's not going to promote maximum efficiency. However, we can be smart about the way that we use our downtime. For example, if your goal is to become the best ever live cash game player, well, in your downtime, think about the following two options. Option number one, check out that latest Netflix series that has nothing to do with poker whatsoever. Option number two, watch a documentary on psychology and body language. Now, if you enjoy that type of thing, that's also a perfectly acceptable type of downtime. But there's a difference one of those activities could potentially also help you with your long-term goals. So yes, your downtime is a break. It's meant to refresh you. It's meant to take you away 
from hard work for a period of time, but that doesn't mean that it can't be productive. So think carefully about the types of activities that you participate in in your downtime, because some of them could potentially tie into your long-term goals, even though they're also providing a relaxing refreshment type experience also. Of course, you want to find a balance here. You want to be reasonable. It's okay to just watch that latest series on Netflix from time to time. But if all of your downtime has nothing to do with your long-term goals, then you're missing out on a valuable opportunity to increase your productivity. It's worth thinking about forced downtime as well. And this is one of those tips that you'll find on pretty much every top 30 productivity tips list ever. And that is to make use of your commute. That's just one example. So you're on the train to work or you're taking a taxi to work. Use that time to listen to a podcast or solve a poker puzzle or do something related to your end goals. And this is not just the commute. This is any time you have an activity that you are forced to do that doesn't necessarily involve a huge amount of your brain power. So it could just be you need to tidy the house. You didn't tidy the house last week. You have to tidy the house this week. Well, usually tidying doesn't take a large amount of brain power. It's more of a physical type of work. So that means while we're doing that work, rather than doing it in silence, our brain is free to potentially be receiving additional information. So that's a great opportunity to put on a relevant podcast or put on some kind of instructional content as you get that work done, which we can refer to as forced downtime in the sense that it's not directly related to our goals. We can still be productive and work towards our goals during that time. So take a moment to think about all of the activities that you don't necessarily do by choice, but you're forced to do. Think about whether it's possible to re-engineer them to be more productive and help you work towards your goals. Now, of course, we need to use judgment here because some activities will require your full focus. And if they don't have your full focus, they could end up being dangerous. So don't try and use those activities to further your long-term goals. But those rather mundane activities where we don't use our brain too much, see if you can re-engineer them to boost your productivity. All right, that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening to my personal take on boosting productivity as poker players. This was Coach Weasel, and this was the Red Chip Poker Podcast.